we're travelling the globe in search of new ideas and new technologies that could change the world. We're talking to the people and the companies creating that change and seeing how our lives could be different in the future. Welcome to Horizons. We're now pushing at the frontiers of farming, not just growing crops on the edges of our productive land, but right here in the heart of our cities. Now, that is partly an attempt to provide us with nutritious, locally produced food, but it's also an attempt to revitalise an industry which in many parts of the world is suffering from a declining and ageing workforce. So, from the countryside to the city, we look at the rise of urban agriculture. Yes, yeah. we like tomatoes. OK. In the Netherlands, they're shining a light on our crucial crops to really understand how they grow. And then I head 33 metres below London to pick the produce for the Michelin-starred kitchen of Michelle Rue Jr. Very, very small, but wonderful, wonderful kick yeah. While Adam is heading below ground, I'm on the rooftops of Cairo to find out about their frontier farms. There's a need to search out more places to grow food because the land that our cities and towns cover globally will grow threefold in the first 30 years of this century. And our rural populations will drop from just under half to nearly a third by 2050. So farming will need to evolve. I've come to the headquarters of Japan's largest recruitment agency, Persona. Now, you can see on the outside, there's lots of greenery growing. In fact, they're growing oranges. That's not unique. But what's going on inside is rather unusual. This really is a living building. Life comes not just in the shape of its office workers, but with the flowers, fruit and vegetables that grow in any available space. It was the idea of Persona's CEO, who's partial to the odd tomato plucked from the ceiling. Wonderful. <laughs> OK. And he's even known to spend his lunch nibbling on a freshly picked lettuce. Please try it. Please try it. <laughs> <laughs> How difficult was it to bring in a hydroponic system mm. into an office where lots of people have got to work? That you can't, mm. They can't just give way to all the tomatoes here. So when I came up with this idea, everyone said no and they all said it would be impossible to do this kind of building. But I treasured my feeling of hope and the courage to actually act upon my thoughts. I thought about the future of Japan as a society, and there was one problem. Japan's agricultural population is declining at a very, very fast rate. So I thought that we need to bring more people into the farming industry, especially since in the future, if there were to be an emergency in food, it's something very important that Japan will face in a crisis. How much of a problem is it attracting employees to work in the agricultural sector here in Japan? Is it a big issue? Even though food and eating is something very close to people's lives, it is still farming. When you think of it as agriculture, I think people hesitate to go into that field. But I think farming has a lot of potential in creating new employment especially for people, regardless of age or sex or where they live and such. So farming would be a very good area where new employment would be created. So the idea of mixing agriculture and office work may have come from the CEO, but making it a reality was the job of architect Yoshimi Kono, who says it's the ideal solution for cities like Tokyo, where property prices are at a premium. Is there a problem, a conflict, between trying to build an environment that's good for humans, for office workers, and an environment that's good for vegetables? They, they might not be the same environment at all. The solution was tomato is in, in the ceiling. Also, light for the tomato, for instance, uh, you need sometimes 20,000 looks of the light. Right. Right? And for the human in the office environment, about 700 looks. 
Right, so right. tomatoes need a lot more light than humans. Right, after tomato grow, right. they make a shade, and underneath is about 700 lux. I mean... Ah, so you've got really a natural self-equilibrium here. Right. The tomatoes themselves block out the light to make it perfect for humans. So it's a, a self-stabilizing system. If the tomato fails, then the people cannot use the space because it's too bright. Looking after the nine floors of greenery are nine full-time employees, including an urban farm manager. Is the idea that the ladies here can just reach up and take a tomato whenever they're hungry? Is that the point? It's the more tabe ho dai this. Where whenever they they want to, yeah, they can do it. <laughs> yes. 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 Really? <laughs> okay. I have to say, I'm wearing a jumper, but it's very hot. It's almost 26 degrees. Does it have to be hot for the tomatoes, and the the ladies just have to suffer? 26 degrees is the best temperature actually for human being as well as the plant. The same temperature? Same temperature. I don't think I'm a tomato person because I need it to be colder than it is now. It's too hot for me. And they're all wearing jackets, but OK. Maybe you can ask them, do they enjoy working underneath a tomato roof? Yes? Yes? Yes. Yes, they, yes, 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 we like tomatoes. <laughs> OK. Farming is taking us into unlikely places in cities and remote spots right around the world. And if we're going to go to those sorts of extremes, we better understand a lot more about the plants we're trying to grow. And that is exactly what they're doing in the Netherlands as Anna Holligan now reports. At Wageningen University, Professor Leo Marcellus researches plant physiology, the science of how crops work, how they function, turning sunlight into food. It's a process called photosynthesis. We need to produce more. We need to produce it of a high quality. And that's where this research contributes to. How efficient can we convert light into an edible part of the plant? So you're looking at how the light is absorbed? Yes. So we can choose different growing conditions. We can improve the yield and by that way. But we can also improve it by new varieties. Within five years, we think that we can improve the energy use efficiency, for instance, with 50%. So that means with the same amount of energy, produce 50% more. Selecting and breeding the most productive varieties is the first step. This has been done by hand for thousands of years. Here, they're speeding up the process by using machines. What do you have in here? We're using camera to measure the uh, photosynthesis of these plants. The beauty of an imaging system like this is that it's non-contact, it's non-destructive, so it allows us to measure all of these plants um, very quickly and we can do so repeatedly. And that allows us to build up a very good um, profile of the photosynthetic behaviour of these plants, varying from one variety to another. Everything we eat really depends on plant photosynthesis and that's why we believe that this research is so important. The robotic scanner uses a flash of red light to work out how efficient each plant is at absorbing light. The best plants are then selected for breeding. The long-term goal is that this should be working in support of plant breeding programs. We're confident that um, we can make a major difference to the breeding of crop plants. The next step is to work out the best way to light plants, specifically for growing crops in greenhouses. What's actually happening? What we really want to increase is the total light absorption of the plants, because if we do so, then we, we will increase the total photosynthesis and production. To increase the total light absorption, you first have to find a way to measure it. And that's exactly what we're doing in here. We have the plant right at the middle of the system, and then we have this robotic arm. At the end, it has a sensor attached. This sensor is uh, measuring the light, how much light there is, and what quality of light there is, what color of light there is. Different plant structures, wide or narrow leaves, bigger leaves at the bottom and smaller leaves at the top, all of this affects how a plant absorbs light. Do you think it has the potential to revolutionize the way that food is produced? Definitely. Imagine right now if you have a, a greenhouse with a specific tomato crop that has an actual total light absorption per crop. If I can increase this by 10%, then uh, that means that I can also increase the yield, maybe not by 10%, but by 5%, which is huge. 
At Wageningen, they're taking the analysis of crops to the next level. Crop simulation models have existed for many decades. However, they did not consider the 3D architecture of plants until now. What we are doing here is we're uh, scanning tomato plants. We're using this laser scanner. We start uh, building a 3D image of the, of the object. So then you can look at a plant as you, though you were looking at it in the real world. We got a complete 3D image of the tomato plant here. And so now you've got a, a complete picture exactly. of those tomato plants. Exactly. So from here, the modeling of the, of the, of the tomatoes. Plants. They call this the virtual plant. By analyzing 3D models of how plants grow and the light they absorb over time, they can then run various simulations. It's allowing researchers to optimize growing conditions that can then be used in the real world. How do you see this progressing in the future? If we look at the food demand of the world, it's rapidly rising. Predictions are that by 2050, we may need to double the food production. So it's very important to increase the efficiency of plants. The benefit to the world is that we can use less energy, but also that we can get a higher yield, more food production. Innovations in plant science may seem small, but the implications of this research could be out of this world. It could make a real difference to feeding the global population. And this could be the next frontier in food production. Overground and underground, the new frontier farmers are going to new lengths to find us the food we need. Farming is not easy. It's stressful. It's a big gamble. It's work from sun up to sundown, and there's certainly a lot at stake. Our family has been involved with farming, you know, for generations. I'm the sole provider, so my livelihood is farming. The farming practices have changed a lot. It's very precise and it's very technical. People may think that you go sow some seeds, but one mistake can cost you a lot of money. My philosophy is, is I can't get everything done, so I try to surround myself by really good people to help me better the business. I feel my DuPont rep is part of my team. We've got a huge task on our hands in, in this agricultural community to feed the world and to fuel the world. DuPont's not just a seed company, and so we need to leverage our science expertise, our agronomy expertise, our technological expertise to determine ways that we can increase production. Pioneer Field 360 gives me a lot of tools in my toolbox. It's really an agronomy pocket PDA. It keeps a, a clear, concise record of everything that he's done throughout the growing season. It's all geo-reference. It's so much more than just taking notes. Say I'm scouting and I find something that I don't know about. I can take a picture and I can send that to another agronomist to help figure out what that is. It's like having thousands of agronomists at your fingertips. We can take that data, we can just try to make decisions for the next year based on the knowledge we have of this previous year or years before. Looking back, right. yes. we really should have planted before the snow. It's great to be able to work together and to tap into some of those minds to truly understand this business and how we can be successful together. You know, you're out in the field and it's amazing how we can grow the crops we can. And you're just so thankful for that. And ultimately, we want to grow more food for everybody in the world. As the global population increases, indeed, as the population of big cities rises, feeding that number of people is becoming increasingly contentious. And what's more, getting the food to them is very hard. But what if you could grow the food right here in the middle of a city like London and not take up any space anybody else is using? Well, that is what they are doing here behind these rather plain-looking doors. To get to this city centre farm, I need to head beneath the busy streets of London, descend 179 steps and walk through the tunnels that were built as an air raid shelter during the Second World War. And finally, after that, I meet up with the co-founder of the business growing underground, Stephen Drink. 
Why did you want to do it? How did you get the idea? It was something that we'd argued about over a long period of time. How are we going to feed populations in the future as cities are starting to grow? Did you really, genuinely, mm. approach this as a solution to a a food problem rather than as a business solution? Within the UK, we are a massive importer of food as it is at the moment, so there's an element of food security. Then also, with the growing population as well, we have a finite amount of arable land in this country. If we can grow this as part of an urban regeneration project, we can then use areas that are being used for salad production at the moment, for cattle right. production. So it's just about complementing farming rather than replacing farming. You're mm -hmm. growing uh, in water, effectively, yeah. no earth. The technology around that isn't particularly new, is it? Hydroponics has been around probably since the 70s. We've been growing significant amounts just using water at, at, and a substrate. But if the technology itself is not new, what is novel about this, this job you're trying to do? There is a lot of benefits of like bringing it closer to the market. They collect it from us every single day to supply into London the next morning. We could have this from pretty much filled to fork in eight hours. I don't really understand the economics of it. You are having to pay for all the light, you have no sun, yep. uh, you have no rain. Energy must be a big problem for you. It's one of our significant costs, without doubt, but all of the lights we're running here is less energy than the one heater that we flick on now and again. So what are you growing here? Uh, so we're growing some rocket here at the moment. OK, and the lights. Tell me a bit about the lights and how they work. So we've got LED lights here. There's a LED light spectrum. So across the light spectrum, the manufacturers just place little bits of ultraviolet all the way through to infrared. It's a mix it's, and it's a blend. So it's the perfect output of a light spectrum. For each for. individual crop? For these, this is for leafy salads. Right. You would use something different for root vegetables or they use them for trees in forestry projects. So yeah, there's a, a, a lot of different spectrum you can use. So are there any limitations to this technology? Can you grow absolutely anything? At the moment, the science says that you can pretty much grow anything with it. Um, you could grow an apple tree. It'd be the most expensive apples you've ever eaten, but you can. Given the amount of resources that you have to bring down here and pay for, yes. is this going to be a lot more expensive than regularly grown rocket to the consumer? No. Everything stacks up for us to go in at the price that is in the marketplace at the so, moment. So it's not a premium product. You don't go grown underground or oh. anything, therefore you pay 20% more? No, certainly within the branding, we do play on the fact that it is grown within yeah. London. But no, there is no need to charge a premium right. into the wholesale or retail markets. And how disruptive do you think your approach might be to the general agricultural industry? I think it's challenging everyone to focus on the fact that there is a sustainable element to farming. It's just about reconnecting people right. with where food comes from. Well, I'm going to be heading back upstairs to the surface to see how they're making use of all the food they're growing down here. But it is a climb of over 33 metres. There is no lift, so it's going to take me quite a while. So in the meantime, let's have a look at the other extreme, how they're growing food on rooftops in Cairo. Uche Okoronkwo is in Africa's second largest metropolis, a mega city that has little in the way of urban agriculture until now. I'm five stories up in a building in the Egyptian capital, an unlikely spot to grow crops and very far from the mighty River Nile. Remarkably, I'm here to meet a new breed of African farmers called Shaduf. The startup provides low-income families with the opportunity to grow and sell rooftop produce. The aim is to lift the people out of poverty. Tarek, what was your inspiration for setting up Shaduf? Cairo has a lot of flat roofs, a lot of empty space uh, that can be uh, utilized. There isn't a lot of uh, available land space to actually have a farm, and agricultural land is also very scarce. So we're really interested in the idea of hydroponics. So uh, we tried to make it happen. On the city's rooftops, they construct shallow ponds with brick sites and waterproof liners that are then filled with a mineral nutrient solution. The vegetable plots float in sheets of styrofoam and wick up the water through long pieces of fabric. A thick matting helps conserve water in Egypt's arid climate. So Tarek, tell me, what are you growing here? So uh, different things actually here, this is uh, spinach. Uh, here you have uh, arugula. Right. And this is uh, here, coriander. We usually focus on those also because they're uh, like fast, uh, they have fast uh, cycles. Right. And the idea here is that uh, the payback period, you know, is one year. 
So it actually becomes like an attractive um, investment uh, opportunity uh, for the individuals. Cairo's rooftop farms can be profitable. Three 20 square meter troughs will earn a family up to $70 a month. The garden costs around $360 to construct and can be paid off by the farmer in less than half a year if all the produce is sold. The training process where they learn how to put the seeds, seeds uh, and look at and uh, care for them and we also teach them harvesting. So we take them through the whole cycle. What sort of business model have you set up? We help people first of all set up the farms. They can buy their farm through uh, loans or donors. We uh, help them grow the crops and then we buy the crops from them and sell them. We collect the produce, we sort it, we package it. Uh, it's just mainly like value adding uh, activities that we do and then we take them to a supermarket. Shadows help with sourcing microfinance, supplying low-cost equipment and creating a market for vegetables is a bid to make the business model sustainable. Mohammed is one of Cairo's farmers who's been growing and selling rooftop produce for four months now. So how did you hear about this Shadow project? Shadoof came to the neighborhood and presented their concept to everyone who lives here, and I thought it was a good idea, so I went for it. When I started the training process, everyone else thought it was a bad idea. No one else was interested. But as soon as I started the project and everyone from the neighborhood saw the results, they all wanted to be a part of it. Mohammed makes up to $25 a month. Some vegetables he consumes, the rest he sells to Shadoof. Certainly, there is demand for Zero Food Miles vegetables in Cairo. One deli called Marzali already uses Shadouf vegetables. Why do you guys buy this Shadouf product? Growing on rooftops means you can get a lot more local than relying on peri-urban or, or rural uh, agriculture. Have you seen a change in terms of people wanting more organic produce? Yeah, I'd say yeah, for sure um, the market's moved significantly towards valuing these products more. There is growth, so hopefully more producers will come on board or producers like Shadouf will be able to expand their production knowing that there is a market for it. 40 farms are now operational, 100 more are planned. Shadouf wants to develop clusters of 10 or more micro farms in different neighborhoods across the city, employing hundreds of people. In a country where millions live in food poverty, rooftop farming could be the answer. Where do you hope to see this project in the next 10 years? We're really hoping that others would do the, start doing similar projects as well. So not just us, but like everyone is really focusing on uh, greening, whether it's through hydroponics, whether it's just uh, adding uh, trees to the streets, whether it's uh, to, you know the wall gardens, any 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 sort of greening we think will have a, really has a lot of benefit uh, for the community. Shadouf is one of the first companies in Egypt bringing life to Cairo's rooftops. They're also a pioneer in urban farming. They're not just helping low-income communities to grow crops, they're also helping them to sell their food. It's a model that could be rolled out across cities in developing countries. I've made it to the kitchens of Michelin-starred chef Michel Roux Jr. Who is one of the supporters and financial backers of the underground farm I visited it earlier. Michel uses some of the produce at his restaurant in central London. But before I try it, I want to know if he thinks there's a serious message behind this novel growing location. I mean, it has to be worthwhile and it has to be ticking the right boxes. And for me, it does, because this is a part of London which is disused. And there are miles and miles and miles of these tunnels. And if we can find a viable way of growing food, then, yeah, that's fantastic. Do you have concerns about the way we grow food and our food production industries? Of course so, you know, and I think as a high-profile chef, we have a responsibility to highlight these issues. Um, but what are, what are the issues in your view? Well, are we going to have enough food to feed the world? The food miles involved in this project are minuscule, aren't they, really? Absolutely minuscule. So it's all very well finding new locations to grow our food, but can the produce that relies on technology as much as nature really measure up on the taste buds? Now what we need is just to finish off with some, some of these lovely shoots. So these are the ones grown in the tunnels? Absolutely. Now this is... So what is that? A red vein sorrel. You see how beautiful right. it yeah. is? And a lovely fresh beetroot kind of flavour. No. And this one is parsley, miniature parsley. It's got a real kick to it. Very, very small, but wonderful, wonderful kick to it. Uh -huh. 
So you don't need much, just a few... Right. Just a few on there. We are ready to serve. In a world which is worried about the future of farming, where agriculture competes with housing and commerce for space, it's obviously a really compelling idea to see food growing in disused underground tunnels. And with ideas like growing food on rooftops in Cairo or combining agriculture and commerce in office blocks in Tokyo, you can see people are hard at work coming up with novel approaches to ensure that we all have enough food in the future.